Good morning. <clears throat> well, welcome. I'm Pastor Beals from Westfield, and I'll actually be back here next week. But um, we have uh, the Puddle Jumpers opening us up with the intro. Thank you. Please join me in the invitation to worship that's found in your bulletin. Praise the Lord. Happy are those who fear the Lord, who greatly delight in his commandments. Their descendants will be mighty in the land. The generation of the upright will be blessed. Wealth and riches are in their houses, and their righteousness endures forever. They rise in the darkness as light for the upright, they are gracious, merciful, and righteous. It is well with those who deal generously and lend, who conduct their affairs with justice. For the righteous will never be moved. They will be remembered forever. They are not afraid of evil tidings. Their hearts are firm, secure in their love. Their hearts are steady. They will not be afraid. In the end, they will look in triumph over their foes. Really. They have given to the poor. Their righteousness endures forever. Their horn is exalted in honor. Come, let us meet the brokenhearted God. Wide are the arms of God. Our gathering hymn is Love's Div Love Divine, All Loves Excelling, number 43.
Please remain standing and join in the opening prayer. Sisters and brothers, let us lift our hearts in faith to the one who hears our all prayers and holds close all those in need. Holy God, we gather the holy universe into your radiant presence and continually reveal your Son as our Savior. Bring healing to all wounds. Make whole all that is broken. Speak truth to all illusion and shed light in every darkness that all creation will see your glory and know your Christ. Amen. To God who welcomes all in love, let us pray for the good of the church and the concerns of those in need. God of every land and nation, you have created all people and you dwell among us in Jesus Christ. Listen to the cries of those who pray to you and grant that as we proclaim the greatness of your name, all people will know the power of love at work in the world. We ask this through Christ our Lord. Amen. In the Lord's Prayer, our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen.
Do we have some young people who would like to come down front? So, I have a question for you. Is salt good for you or bad for you? Bad for you? And bad for you? Bad for you? Oh, it would depend. Okay. Anybody else? It's debatable. Anybody think it's good for you? Well, you can't live without it. You're both right. You're all right. Everybody's right. Salt's good for you. You can't live without it. And salt is absolutely essential for life, and too much salt is not good. Have you ever heard of the Dead Sea? Never heard of the Dead Sea? Boy, it's a big sea in Israel, and it is very, 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 very salty. In fact, it's so salty that nothing lives in it. Well, there's some microorganisms that live in it, but no fish. But here's a fun fact. There is so much salt in the water in the Dead Sea that you can float in the water even if you don't try. You can't sink. And I know that because I've been there and I've floated in it. But salt and other minerals that are found in the Dead Sea are great for the skin and it's used for soap and beauty products. So the same salt that's good for your skin is very bad for fish. Now when Jesus talks to his disciples and he says, you are the salt of the earth. So he's thinking about the good things that salt can do. Not only can you use it to help clean things, but you can use it to preserve foods like meats and stuff like that. Have you ever had ham? Yes. Now, Jesus would not have had ham um, because they don't eat, uh, he would not have eaten pork, but uh, they did use salt for preserving meats. So, salt was actually even used for money. The soldiers in the Roman army were sometimes paid with salt because it was so valuable. Now, in the Bible, salt is used to represent permanence, as things that last, loyalty, faithfulness, usefulness, value, like giving the troops salt as payment, and for purification, to make you clean. That's what Jesus wants from us. Every time you're eating too much salt, that's bad for you. But for Jesus, when he calls us, he wants us to be the salt of the earth, that means he wants us to be pure and faithful and useful, not only to God, but to each other. Can you pray with me? God of all, help us to live up to Jesus' call that we be the salt of the earth, loyal, faithful, and useful, not only to God, but also to each other. Amen. Thank you. Please join me in the invitation to the offering. As salt sustains our bodies, our offering sustains the mission of this church and ministers to our members, our community, and our world. We present our gifts in the hope, prayerful hope that our small contribution to God's work might bear mighty fruit. Amen. And now may we praise God with our morning offering. We give thanks for these gifts brought forward in a spirit of love 
May we be good stewards of our resources so that we can do all that we are able to do to work for God's kingdom. Amen. Do we have joys or concerns to be shared with the congregation at this time? Please leave a comment or send us an email with your joys and concerns, and we will pray for you. Shall we join in prayer together? Gracious and loving God, you call us to be the salt of the earth. And we go, what does that mean? It means that you call us to be faithful and pure. It means you call us to be fruitful. It calls us to be joyful in, even in sad times. It calls us to respond to you and to each other with forgiveness, with faith, with perseverance, and with joy. Be with us as we struggle, because every person is going to struggle. Every person has unmet needs. And you put us here to try our hardest to meet those needs, to be a light shining in darkness, to be strength where there is weakness, to be grace and mercy. And we ask all this because you have called us to be the salt of the earth. Let us pray in silence as we share our own thoughts with the divine. Gracious God, may we know your presence. May we feel your light. May we share your grace. May we be with you. Amen. Our Second Testament reading is from Paul's letter to the Corinthians, chapter 2, verses 1 through 16. When I came to you, brothers and sisters, I did not come proclaiming the mystery of God to you in lofty words or wisdom, for I decided to know nothing among you except Jesus Christ and him crucified. And I came to you in weakness and in fear and in much trembling. My speech and my proclamation were not with plausible words of wisdom, but with a demonstration of the Spirit and of power, so that your faith might not rest on human wisdom, but on the power of God. Yet among the mature we do not speak wisdom, though it is not a wisdom of this age or the age, the rulers of this age who are doomed to perish, but we speak God's wisdom, secret and hidden, which God decreed before the ages for our glory. None of the rulers of this age understood this, for they, if they had, they would not have crucified the Lord of glory. But as it is written, what no eye has seen, nor ear heard, nor the human heart conceived, what God has prepared for those who love him. These things God has revealed to us through the Spirit, for the Spirit searches everything even the depths of God. For what human being knows what it is to be truly human except the human spirit that is within? So also no one comprehends what is truly God's except the spirit of God. Now we have received not the spirit of the world, but the spirit that is from God, so that we may understand the gifts bestowed on us by God. And we speak of these things in words 
not taught by human wisdom, but taught by the Spirit, interpreting spiritual things to those who are spiritual. Those who are unspiritual do not receive the gifts of God's Spirit, for they are foolishness to them. And they are unable to understand them because they are spiritually discerned. Those who spiritually discern all things, and they are themselves subject to no one else's scrutiny. For who has known the mind of the Lord so as to instruct him? But we have the mind of Christ. And from the book of Matthew, the Gospel reading, chapter 5, verses 13 through 20. You are the salt of the earth. But if salt has lost its taste, how can its saltiness be restored? It's no longer good for anything, but is thrown out and trampled underfoot. You are the light of the world. A city built on a hill cannot be hid. No one, after lighting a lamp, puts it under a bushel basket, but on the lampstand, so that it gives light to all of the house. In the same way, let your light shine before others so that they may see your good works and give glory to your Father in heaven. Do not think I have come to abolish the laws of the prophets. I have come not to abolish, but to fulfill. For truly, I tell you, until heaven and earth pass away, not one letter, not one stroke of a letter, will pass from the law until it all is accomplished. Therefore, whoever breaks one of the least of these commandments and teaches others to do the same will be called least in the kingdom of heaven. But whoever does them and teaches them will be called great in the kingdom of heaven. For I tell you, unless your righteousness exceeds that of the scribes and the Pharisees, you will never enter the kingdom of heaven. The word of the Lord. May the words of my mouth and the meditation of all of our hearts be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, our rock and our redeemer. Matthew, Mark, and Luke all relate the same or similar versions of this story. Only Matthew uses the phrase, you are the salt of the earth. All three of the gospel writers agree that Jesus talks about the fact that if salt loses its most essential quality, that is, its taste, it becomes worthless. Indeed, Luke goes so far as to say, it is useless either for the soil or for the manure pile. It is thrown out. It's interesting to me that Mark's version, which is likely the version that Matthew and Luke expanded in their own Gospels, leaves out both the phrases, you are the salt of the earth, and Matthew and Luke's commentary that salt that's lost his saltiness is worthless. But he also has a phrase that's not found in the other Gospels. Mark writes, salt is good, But if the salt becomes unsalty, what will make it salty again? Have salt in yourselves and be at peace with one another. So the line Matthew and Luke leave out is have salt in yourselves and be at peace with one another. Now, to figure out what these gospel writers are getting at, we need to understand what the Jewish scriptures say about salt. And it's really a mixed bag. Probably the first thing you might remember is Lot's wife being turned into a pillar of salt, which seems a little drastic and unpleasant. It's described as God's punishment for looking back on the town of Sodom that God had destroyed. The author of Genesis doesn't even think it's worth noting Lot's wife's name. 
Now, salt is also referred to in the First Testament as a symbol of desolation. The Dead Sea is a body of water with such a high content, as we mentioned to the kids, that no sea creatures live in them at all. And yet, salt is also demanded in the Law of Moses for sacred sacrifices. Newborn babies are regularly rubbed with salt as purification. Salt was also a useful economic commodity. In some cases, as I mentioned, Roman soldiers were paid in salt. One thing we know about salt, it's absolutely essential to life, but too much salt can be deadly. You know that if you only had <clears throat> seawater to drink, ocean water, salt water, you'd die. But if you had no salt, you'd die. Perhaps the reason the stark contrast in the First Testament readings of salt. It, it is at the same time salvific, that is used for purification, and vital, and redemptive, and potentially deadly. There are a couple things to be clear about the gospel writer's inclusion of this particular story. First, since all of the writers cite it, it's almost certainly one of the authentic stories that Jesus told. It's also clear that Jesus was speaking in metaphor. Even though he wasn't a chemist, he certainly knew that sodium chloride never loses its saltiness. It's true that if salt <clears throat> gets wet, it clumps up, but it doesn't lose its saltiness. Salt that is harvested from ancient oceans that's been underground for millions of years, and it doesn't lose its saltiness. It seemed clear that Jesus was making a positive statement about salt. He tells his followers they are the salt of the earth. Have salt in yourselves and be at peace with one another. That gives it a distinctly spiritual quality. It's not the physical substance we're talking about. Perhaps when we say, have salt in yourselves, we could substitute the words, have faith in yourselves, have trust in one another, be pure in heart, act with pure intentions. We could read the passage as encouraging the followers of Christ to see the divine in each person and be at peace with one another. Now, if that reading is correct, it certainly works for all three Gospels versions when they say that the salt can indeed lose its saltiness. That is, we can lose faith in one another. We can lose faith in ourselves. We can lose faith in God. We cannot act with pure intentions when our intentions are not pure. It becomes another retelling of Christ's command for us to love one another as God loves us. That is, freely, with pure intent, without conditions. It also makes sense that if we lose faith, if we lose trust, it makes us worthless in terms of our ability to follow Christ's path and to work for the establishment of God's kingdom on earth. Luke's telling of the consequences of losing faith is the darkest of all the gospel writers. Salt that loses its saltiness, or as it is interpreted here, faith that has been lost is useless either for soil or the manure pile. It is thrown out. Loss of faith not only contaminates the soil, it even destroys the fertilizer. It even destroys the dung heap. Now, that's a pretty disturbing image. This interpretation also makes complete sense when we consider what we've already said about the dual nature of salt. It's vital for life, and yet it can be deadly. When it comes to the metaphor of comparing salt to faith, 
we realize that like salt, it is true that having too much faith can be as deadly as having too little faith. We must recognize that faith can be rendered useless if it is tied too much to legalisms or rituals that have become meaningless. Jesus is constantly reminding folks that the Pharisees may be strict and righteous adherents of the law of Moses and the rules of the temple and still not be true to the great commandments of God to love one another as God loves us. Their faith has been rendered useless by putting too much faith in ritual and atonement and not enough faith in love and forgiveness. For Christ, faith is not about following a book of rules, but of serving God by serving one another. The rules are there only to guide us along the path. They're not created to render us blind to suffering. They're not made to give us excuses for not rushing to the aid of our fellow brothers and sisters. The ancient story of the Good Samaritans is an excellent example of how too much faith destroys the ability to follow God's teachings. Why did the priest and Levite pass the injured Samaritan on the path by the side of the road? Because the law commanded it. They were not permitted to touch someone who was unclean. Now, he was lying by the side of the road, beaten half to death, so he would have been bloody. And that would have been sufficient reason for the law-abiding righteous men to avoid any contact with this person. Add to the fact he's lying in this heap on the side of the road and there's no way to tell if he's worthy of their aid. The Levite and the priest had lost their saltiness. By choosing salt for this metaphor, we can see that Jesus probably intentionally picked something that had both positive and negative qualities. Salt is essential for life used in ritual purification and sacrifice, commodity of great value, Yet salt was found to kill nearly all life in the Dead Sea. Lot's wife was turned into a pillar of salt. Salt marshes were a symbol of desolation and lost life. All of these qualities are perfect for delivering the message that Jesus wanted his followers to hear. When he tells us we are the salt of the earth, he's telling us that we have the qualities that can uplift and heal and forgive. And at the same time, those exact qualities can make us destroyers of life. The salt loses its saltiness when faith loses its ability to be tempered by love and forgiveness. It loses all effectiveness and becomes deadly. We become the Levites and the priests who pass by on the other side, believing that our faith is guiding us when in fact, faith has been re rendered useless. Christ is giving us a clear warning. Whoever has ears to hear, let them hear. When we gather for communion each month, we call upon the great the sacred institution of the Lord's Supper to make of us your salt and your light and your leaven. When we say this, let us clear, be clear in our minds and in our hearts about the dual nature of salt. We do not want to become the salt that has lost its saltiness. We do not want to have the kind of faith that renders us useless with blind adherence to law and ritual that only serves to prevent us from loving and serving God's people. But we do want to be the salt of the earth, the salt that adds flavor and seasoning to an existence that can be sometimes bitter or worse, tasteless. We are called to be the salt that adds seasonings to our lives that have become bland and stagnant. And not simply our own lives, but those who are beaten down by the side of the road, the outcast and those who are in pain 
Jesus tells us not that we will be the salt of the earth, but that in following him, we already are. May it be so. Amen. Please join me in the litany for communion that's in your bulletin. You worked the world into being, instilled all creation with life, and shaped us as your people. In Jesus Christ, the bread of life and the true vine, you feed us with the word and nourish us from the stalk. At table with a circle of his friends, Jesus took bread and blessed and broke it and gave it to them, saying, Take, eat. This is my body given for you. Remember me each time you do this. And after supper, he took the cup, gave thanks for the wine, and shared it with his friends, saying, Take, drink. This is God's promise poured out for you. Remember me each time you drink it. O present one, help us to recognize the risen Christ in the breaking of the bread. Open our eyes, warm our hearts, send your spirit in blessing. Yours is the wheat, yours is the lie, yours is the leaven and the love. Send us from this, uh, send us from this upon this cup. O God of Christ, goodness, through Jesus Christ, with the Holy Spirit, let all creation give you glory, now and forevermore. Amen. At this time, you can come forward and partake of the elements. breaking of the bread, we recognize the risen Christ. Take, eat, in remembrance of the risen Christ. In the cup of blessing, we taste and see how gracious is our Savior, the gifts of God for the people of God. Come, take, and drink in recognition of the presence of the living Christ. Holy One, you gave us this day our daily bread and nourished us with Christ's presence. Send us from this meal with the bread of life to feed all hunger for your word. Send us from this meal to care for your gift, this fragile and beautiful planet. Send us from this meal with the cup of life to work in justice and joy, the world sharing the abundance of God. Make of us your salt and light and your leaven. In Christ's name we pray. Amen.
As we leave this morning, may we remain in communion with the living Spirit of God, made known to us through Jesus Christ. May we strive to follow his teaching and example as we confront any trials, frustrations, illness, anger, or any of the other human conditions that challenge us. May we remain in the spirit of healing and love and bless all we encounter. Amen.